And good, we are uh, recording. So are you, you, are you able to see the screen, the book of Zephaniah? Okay, yes. perfect, good, that's what I want you to see. All right, so welcome to another um, kind of session in our walk through the Minor Prophets. Um, this is, I think this is the fifth one that I've recorded and put online. And um, Debbie is here with me today and maybe some others will join us otherwise. You'll be watching this um, a little later on, and I'm glad that you found uh, this channel, and I'm glad that you're watching this. Um, we're going to be walking through today the book of Zephaniah, and uh, I'm going to do what I always do just for better audio quality. I'm going to put you on mute, Debbie, but if you have a question at any point, just um, raise your hand and wave, and I'll unmute you, and then uh, we, we can dialogue a bit. So... Um, okay, the book of Zephaniah, this is um, a, a book that I've titled Seeking Shelter from the Storm. Um, it's, uh, it, it had been a little while since I had read through this book, and so I had, there's, there's one passage at the very end that I'm, it's, it's probably one of my favorite passages in all of the Old Testament. Um, I know you're not really supposed to have favorite parts of God's Word because it's all God's Word, but, um, but this, this passage is a, is a real favorite of mine. However, it had been a while since I'd read the rest of the book, and there was there was a real contrast that I noticed. Um, the first two and a half chapters are very sobering in their in their description of God's judgment, and um, it, it portrays it, and hence the title, it portrays it as a storm that's coming. And so there's there's two and a half chapters of this very descriptive language that is, I think, meant to inspire some amount of fear in the listener and then it ends with this this beautiful call to uh, not only to seek shelter in god's care but also to be reassured of his love and so as we've we've kind of worked through the minor prophets we've noticed that theme come up again and again which is how does god's justice and his his legitimate hatred of evil fit together with his mercy and his compassion. And I think we, we've said this a number of times now, but our culture today, our, our way of thinking usually pits those two ideas against each other. Uh, so either you have an angry, ill-tempered God who hates evil and he just wants to punish and smite everybody, or you have a God who's kind and loving and forgiving and compassionate. And given the choice, most people I think would take the kind and loving, compassionate God. Um, both of those ideas, both of those, let's call them visions of God, are, um, they're really distortions. And that's, I think, an idea that we have to learn to wrap our minds around. It's not one or the other, it's both. And Zephaniah really brings that out. And so we'll see that um, in a minute as we go through here. So, um, minor prophets in general, we're looking at the overall theme. How do God's covenant people live in relationship with God? with each other and in the broader world. So we've emphasized, and I, I'm not gonna to say too much about this again today, but just this idea that God isn't just coming down and um, demanding a random group of people live in a particular way. He's speaking to his people and he calls his people to live in a, in a particular way in faithfulness to the covenant that he has made with them. Uh, when God calls his people out of Egypt, he enters into a relationship with them that is governed and defined by a covenant and that covenant then has implications and it has warnings when the covenant is not upheld and it has consequences for that and it has blessings when the covenant is upheld so that's sort of the ongoing question is how do god's people live into that relationship so that they might uh, avoid the, the the penalties or the consequences and that they might enjoy the blessings of god's relationship with his people um, and more often than not, unfortunately, it seems like the, the prophets are warning that they're about to experience the, the, the curses of the covenant or the consequences of breaking the covenant rather than uh, the blessings of the covenant. But that's, that's an underlying theme. We can't understand the minor prophets without that idea of covenant. Um, and, and we've said that that covenant is both horizontal, that is, it deal, or I should, let's start vertical. It deals with the, the people's relationship with God, right? So that's the vertical dimension, but God's covenant also has horizontal implications. It deals with how do, um, how do societies and communities um, govern themselves? What does that look like in, for, for God's people in terms of how they relate to one another? 
Um, but then also, how does it relate to the broader world? So we've said a number of times that God does not call his people into isolation from the world, but into a form of engagement with the world. And what does that look like? Um, and there are different implications uh, for that. So we've, we've kind of explored all those ideas. I think those are all the, some of the, the main themes that come through as we go through um, each of the books. And Zephaniah, of course, is no different. Um, just by way of summary, of uh, I'm highlight some of the, um, the books that we've looked at so far. The book of Hosea portrays God's covenant as the marriage relationship. And so obedience is about living in relationship with God the way a husband and wife would. And disobedience is then portrayed as, uh, as adultery, spiritual adultery. Uh, the book of Joel deals with um, how do God's people make sense of this natural disaster that was coming upon the land? How would they, um, what, what did that mean? And it became a picture really of, of judgment on sin and a call to repentance that the, the curse might be lifted. The book of Amos deals with God's people as they were ripe for judgment, but also the promise that um, when the relationship between God and his people was restored that they would be um, experiencing the abundance of a good harvest again. So there's kind of that contrast of, you know, you're overripe for judgment, but God would restore his people again. The book of Obadiah deals with sibling rivalry. How do God's people live in relationship with the Edomites who um, tracing the lineage back, they were actually the spiritual sibling um, of Israel in one sense. They traced their lineage back to Jacob and Esau. And that book gives us a picture, actually, of what election is, how God chooses one people um, over another, and what the implications of that all mean. The book of Jonah deals with God's mission in the world. How do God's people then see the, the nations around them, particularly as it relates to God's uh, mission? Um, so we looked at that. Then the book of Micah talks a lot about what it means to live in relationship with, with God as king. Um, and then the book of Nahum, we, remember we've always said Nahum and, and Jonah kind of pair together because Jonah deals with God's compassion for the nations while Nahum balances that with a warning that God would also bring judgment on the nations um, to the extent that they also practice wickedness and violence. Uh, last week we looked at the book of Habakkuk, which is um, trusting God when the world doesn't make sense. Uh, Habakkuk asks those age-old questions of God, which is, why is God allowing so much evil in the world? And um, the, the answer comes back to Habakkuk in a way that at first absolutely shocked him, um, because God, he sense, he says, God, his plans are, um, are, are incomprehensible, and at first they were, because God says, I'm actually going to bring things, I'm going to bring judgment upon the evil in my people by using an even worse group of people. But then we looked at how that, that tension is ultimately resolved, ultimately through the cross of, uh, of Christ. So, um, oops, let me put, there we go. Um, and then today's Zephaniah, um, I don't know, Debbie, you grew up in California, I think, right? And so um, I'm not sure if you're familiar with, with what this is. Um, they're all over the place in the Midwest. It's a tornado siren. Um, I, I'm not assuming that you're ignorant, but... <laughs> Not at all, but just uh, tornado sirens, are, we just don't get those out over this way. Um, but in, in like Michigan, um, I, you know, it's always kind of funny because um, usually they have to test them always on the first day of the month. At, and usually it's a designated time, like 12 o'clock noon. Well, a few years ago, our family was visiting family in Michigan and we were there and all of a sudden uh, this tornado siren starts going off. And of course, my kids had never heard this before. And so, you know, these things are loud. They're meant to be heard across the whole city. And so all of a sudden these sirens are going off and we say, oh, that's the tornado siren. And my kids started freaking out. They didn't know that it was just a test. Um, and so anyways, I, Zephaniah in that sense, I think functions like a, uh, in some ways, like a tornado siren. It's a warning. Um, and when you hear that, you're supposed to, of course, when you hear the tornado, unless it's the, the you know, the monthly test, you're supposed to seek shelter. Uh, the tornado siren is not meant to, um, it's not meant to scare you just for the sake of scaring you, but it's actually meant to call you to seek shelter. And I, I look at the book of Zephaniah like that. It is a book that speaks of uh, the severity of God's judgment, but it does that not just to present a torturous and angry and ill-tempered God, but it does that to show us that God's judgment on sin is real, but there's a way that we can seek shelter from that. There's, a, there's the opportunity that we have to, um, to, to be safe. And so 
Uh, and, and as we're going to see, that's biblically, that's how the, the message of judgment is almost always presented. It's almost always laid out for us as a way of uh, seeking safety. And so that's, um, that's what we see in the book of, of Zephaniah. Um, that's kind of a nutshell. So that's, that's a quick uh, overview of all the prophets. Um, I'll just pause real quick and ask Debbie if you have any questions at this point or any comments that you'd want to make. Nothing? All right, then we'll move on. Okay, let's, um, let's put Zephaniah on a timeline. Um, unlike other prophets that are a little bit harder to pin down in terms of exactly when they lived and ministered, Zephaniah is, uh, is quite easy to, to figure out when... Um, he ministered, and, and we say that because uh, the prophet, he, he tells us right in the first verse, um, as many of the prophets do, not all of them, but many of them do, and, um, and we actually get the most extensive genealogy of all the minor prophets here in chapter 1, verse 1. Um, some of the minor prophets just give us a name, some of them give us a name with like the son of so-and-so, um, and then they tie it to the reign of a particular king. In this case, we actually get um, a, a family lineage that goes back, let's see, one, two, three, four generations. And so we actually have a, a you know, it ties it pretty well into a, um, into a, a particular time and um, family. But more important, it ties it in all probability to a couple of kings. It, it helps us to see that, um, and I'm going to say more about this in a minute, but it helps us see that quite possibly Zephaniah was the great, great grandson of King Hezekiah. Um, and so that kind of gives us a generational framework, but it also, we also see that he was in power during um, Ammon, the king of Judah. So that gives us a very particular time. We do know that, um, well, let, let me say this first. Um, again, Zephaniah gives us the lineage that takes him back to uh, Hezekiah. Now, there's, a, there's some discussion on that, that that very well could be King Hezekiah, who was generally a good king. Um, it's not a certain thing. It's not a, it's not a, it's not a, you know, an open and shut case that he, that, that Hezekiah is the same king. But many scholars agree that it is. And the reason for that is that why would you put your full genealogy going back four generations if you were not tying it to someone of some importance? And so the logic goes that because King Hezekiah is tracing it back to his great great grandfather Hezekiah, or pardon me, because Zephaniah is tracing his lineage back four generations to his great great grandfather Hezekiah, he's doing that to show people that he was, um, we'd say, blue blooded. He's part of royal. He's got royal blood. Um, that seems to be a very sensible argument to me. I, I think that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to just go on the assumption that indeed Zephaniah was uh, part of this, this royal lineage um, in the line of, uh, of Judah. Um, what do we know about, um, about the, the time and the date and the, and the situation in Judah while Hezekiah was writing this? Well, we know he's writing during Ammon, king of Judah. Um, Date-wise, we're looking at between 640 and 620 BC, um, might even be a little bit closer on towards like maybe another 10 years this direction, so it could be as late as 610. Um, the reason that's important is because, as, as I mentioned last week when we were looking at uh, Habakkuk, we're getting really close to this major milestone in Israel's history, which is around here, 586 BC, so right in this area here. Um, that's when the southern kingdom falls. That's when finally God has, his, his patience has run out with them. And so he allows them to be carried into exile. Um, that happened much earlier for Judah. That happened way over, or for Israel, the northern kingdom, that happened in 722. It took uh, about another 120 some odd years before it happened in Judah. Um, but the reason that that's relevant is because actually there was, there was a time even close to when Zephaniah is ministering where things had actually leveled off and maybe were even somewhat more positive in terms of the spiritual climate in, um, in Judah, at least on the surface. And so, you know, the people are bringing their offerings and their sacrifices and perhaps they're, you know, they think that everything is going okay because we've had a king who's brought some good spiritual revival in the, in the country. Um, but what they don't know and what they don't realize is that they're headed for this cliff here. They're headed for that time when um, actually God is going to allow the judgment of the nations to come upon them. Um, the reason for that being that probably that even if things were good on the surface, underneath um, the, 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 re the religious reforms had maybe been more um, had, had not taken or they hadn't lasted or maybe they weren't um, 
they weren't real changes of the heart. And so the prophets come along and they are warning the people that, hey, uh, don't get complacent here. That was maybe one of the big problems is, is complacency. The hearts of the people um, were not yet changed. And so Zephaniah then kind of speaks into that context where um, the people, you know, on the surface, some things maybe had gotten a little bit better, although there were still obvious problems in the broader culture. And, um, and, and um, therefore, God's judgment was still coming. It was, was still something that they had to take seriously. That's at least the, the theory. And there's maybe some differing opinions on that. But that seems to be a logical um, answer and explanation to me for in terms of date and, and culture and history and such. Um, questions on that? Sure. All right. Let me. There you go. You're unmuted. Okay. Uh, this, this theme sounds familiar of, of perhaps, you know, the nation getting a little bit better under a, a, a ruler that is uh, more attuned to worshiping the Lord, mm -hmm. and yet there still are warnings. And it made me think in our hearts, as you have, have, as you have spoken before about uh, longing for home, mm -hmm. we sometimes, you know, of course we want good rulers, but I'm wondering, uh, it, it seems to be such a pattern with people of wanting heaven here, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, but knowing as believers, knowing that our home isn't here, but yet it kind of yeah. can get mixed up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So um, I guess, I don't know what the question is other than... <laughs> well, that, that, that's, that's, such a, that's such an important reflection question musing to to sort of sit on and there's a I, I see a number of layers to it one of them and and actually we're going to come back to a couple of those because you you just you zeroed in on something that i think is part of this book of habakkuk which is um you know how do how do we live in this world without being of the world that kind of thing one of the main differences though that we always have to keep in mind is that difference between god's old testament uh covenant people and here and, and living in the 21st century when we're not, you know, in, in the nations that we're a part of, whether it be United States or Canada or Liberia or wherever we are, are not called to be God's chosen nation. And so we have to always make that distinction in our minds. We don't, it, it, we, well, let me, I'm going to say this and then I'm going to parse it out a little bit because it, it, that's why I say it has all these layers to it. We don't necessarily want to, and I don't think we are called to try to Christianize the nation that we're a part of, right? Um, and, and, and we can see that even in the New Testament, I can't find any place where Paul uh, calls on the church to somehow Christianize the Roman Empire. It's like you get this, this, this group of people who have been changed by the gospel and they're living out their faith and they're living out their calling in whatever place that they are, whether it be dealing in purple cloth, whether it be working in government, like we see a couple people named, um, but nowhere are they called to somehow bring in this kingdom of God in a, in a governmental fashion, right? They're not called to Christianize the Roman Empire. They're not called to work for this utopian society on earth. We get swept up in that, whether we lean politically now, whether we lean to the left or to the right. I mean, we see it on both sides. Um, and, and there's always tension in how do we, you know, so we don't want to necessarily say, well, we don't care what the rest of the culture does. We just, you know, we're just living for heaven. But neither do we want to say, well, we need to Im impose Christian values and traditions and, and beliefs on all aspects of society. Um, now, that's very easy to theorize about. It's much harder to talk about uh, or to, to actually live it out. Um, so, so, yeah, I mean, that's not much of an answer, maybe, but it's, it's just kind of a, a reflection on that. It, and, and Christians have wondered since the beginning of time, what does that look like, right? Augustine is writing the city of God to address that. Um, much more recently, we have, well, within the last 50, 75 years, we have books like Christ and Culture by Niebuhr that talks about all these different ways that Christians relate to the broader culture. More recently, there's been something called Two Kingdom Theology, which says, well, God's covenant with Noah was, was sort of this broad relationship with all of creation um, and we live as part of that kingdom, but we also live as a part of this spiritual kingdom that God establishes when he makes a covenant with Abraham. Um, so there's no shortage of information and thoughts uh, being put into that. Um, and I'm not sure that answers any question that you have other than to maybe muddy the waters a bit more. But um, but it, it, is a, it is a question that, um, yeah, people have been wrestling with for, for a very long time. 
So thought, thoughts on that? Did that, did that answer or address it? Yeah, go ahead. Uh, in our uh, coffee break yesterday, um, we were studying Psalm 105, and it referenced one of the verses, Psalm uh, 105, 7, referenced um, Isaiah 26, 9, and I, I just loved it because it said something which I think causes, it says 26, 9, Isaiah 26, 9 says, my soul yearns for you in the night, my spirit within me earnestly seeks you, and this is the key, for when your judgments are in the earth, the inhabitants of the world learn righteousness. Right. And so what that makes me think of is, this is how we can get confused in a way, because we are to, how, how's the world supposed to learn righteousness except through God's people? Right. right. And so there's, so there's that battle. Right. But, yeah. but the world is not our home, but yet we are to stand for the Lord here. Right, right. Yeah, you've nailed it. I mean, that's, that's exactly that tension. Um, we aren't indifferent to the way that our communities, cities, towns, nations conduct themselves. But true, and, and maybe that's a, a good kind of segue into, the, into what we talked about uh, earlier and what kind of where we're going is true righteousness um, is not something we ourselves can manufacture. So, so that's, that's true on, um, you know, that's true when it comes to can you, can you impose Christian morality externally on a nation? Well, no, you can't. You can't impose it individually on a person from the outside. Biblically, the idea of righteousness is, is that it flows from a changed heart, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, even Adam and Eve in the beginning, their, their righteousness was the fact that they were in this perfect relationship with God. Sin gets in the way, cuts us off, and from that point on, the human race is alienated from God. We become self-reliant. We become self-centered, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, religion teaches us, here's how to climb back up right? Here's how to get back up to this place where you're good enough again. Well, the gospel doesn't teach us that, right? And, and so many people look at Christianity that way as well. Okay, being a Christian means that you, you know, you should go to church uh, on Sunday, you should pray, you should, you know, uh, don't have sex before marriage, outside of marriage, or after marriage, etc. Uh, and there's a whole long, depending on where you're, who you're talking to, there's a code of morality that says, well, this is Christian, this is what it means to be a Christian. Well, yes, those behaviors generally are consistent with Christianity, but Christianity is not about climbing the ladder to get up to God, right? It's about actually a renewed and changed heart that comes from the inside and then works its way outward. So, yes, we become then a witness to the nations. We become people who are salt and light and we demonstrate to the world what righteousness looks like. I think sometimes the best way we do that is, is more by just living it out and actually, it, you know, becomes an attractive thing mm -hmm. rather than going out and charging into the world and say, the whole world must do it this way. I think that ends up having the very opposite effect. Yeah. Um, but, but I mean, it's, it's like I said earlier, it's an issue that, that has raised discussion questions uh, and tons and tons of books and articles and dissertations and everything else on the subject because it is a very rich topic um and, and i'm going to say a little more about it too as we go on i think that some we'll get to some of that as well so i'm um, good all right any other questions uh, all right okay let's um let's look at well let me let me before i do that let's oh, i'm going the wrong way here let me um let me just take you really quick through an outline of the book uh, the book breaks down fairly neatly into a number of different parts. Um, chapter one, verse one, is that superscription, as we call it, which is uh, usually, it's, it's a feature of most books in, well, New and Old Testament. Uh, it just tells us who wrote it and maybe some background information, genealogy, etc. So that's chapter one, verse one. Um, one verses two, one, chapter one, verses two to three, is a broad announcement of judgment. That's where God says, um, and it starts off, I will sweep away everything from the face of the earth. So if that doesn't catch your attention, uh, nothing will, right? God knows how to, how to grab the audience. So, uh, and then it goes on sweeping away animals and birds and fish. And it, it just lays out this picture of absolute destruction in the world. And then after that, God gets more particular. He applies the message first to the people of Judah, which is uh, chapter 1, verse 4, to chapter 2, verse um, uh, 3. 
And in that section, we find a description of what's called the Day of the Lord, which is a major theme in both Zephaniah and in the book of Joel. And it's, it's a description of God's, it's, it's the day of reckoning. It's when God will come to, um, to, to establish justice by punishing um, sin and wickedness in the world. So God's judgment, in, or the day of the Lord entails God's judgment on all forms of sin, and nothing will escape his, his sight. And so we read about that in chapter uh, 1, verses 14 through, I think it's about 17 or 18. And then uh, it finishes, it, the, the, that chapter uh, that section finishes in, I think, chapter 2, verse 3. Then, so, so that's judgment, judgment against Judah, including the day of the Lord. And then, which, by the way, um, that, idea, that theme of the day of the Lord is kind of a bridge because God first starts off talking to the nations, or uh, let me say that differently, God's people assume that the day of the Lord was a day that would be meant for the nations. Um, they, when they thought about the day of the Lord, they thought finally the day of reckoning will come when all these terrible other nations around the world will finally, you know, they'll get their own. Um, but what uh, Zephaniah does is he actually takes that and he starts with Judah. He says, okay, he, he pronounces judgment. And then from there he says, this judgment that you're going to experience is the day of the Lord that you keep getting so excited about. And then, and you assume it's only for the nations, but God wants you to see that it's for you as well. Um, and then in chapter 2, verses 4 through uh, the, rent, the, the, the rest of chapter 2, then Zephaniah goes around and he gets out his atlas, as it were, and he points to all the other nations of the world. And he says, they too will stand before the bar of justice. And, um, and, and he goes one nation after the other. So it's Philistia, then the Moabites and Ammonites, then it's the people of Cush, and then finally it's the people of Assyria. And so one after the other, these nations are summoned to stand before God, as it were, and they're told that they will be judged as well. And the message in all of that is that there's no, there's, in, there is an advantage to being God's people, but you're not off the hook either, right? So yes, you have an advantage, but in a sense, that advantage only, as Paul talks about in the book of Romans, that advantage only makes you more accountable because you've been given this advantage of, of having God's law and having the covenant. And so you will be judged to a higher standard. Um, the nations will be judged as well. Uh, the nations don't get uh, to, they don't get a free pass just because they, you know, didn't know so much about God. And so, well, we can do whatever we want. And, you know, no one is ever going to call us to account. The message is that judgment comes both ways. It comes to, uh, it comes on all unrighteousness and all wickedness and on all, all evil. Um, in chapter three, we get very particular. Now we move into the city of Jerusalem. And so we've talked about judgment on the nations. We've talked about judgment on the, the nation of Judah. And now there's this, this description of the city of Judah. And I'm going to say a little more about that after a bit, because the idea of the city in scripture, um, and that's kind of what we were talking about a couple minutes ago, is a big theme. And the, because the city represents power and it represents God's dwelling place and it represents God's governance and, um, and worship and, and the city had been corrupted. And so now God is saying, even the city, the dwelling place of God, Mount Zion itself will be uh, under God's judgment. Um, but then, and this is where the, the book makes this beautiful transition starting in about uh, chapter three, verse nine. After all this judgment has taken place, after all the evil has been punished, then God transitions and he starts talking about a remnant that he's going to preserve. He's going to, it's like the evil has been purged from the land and now the land is sort of cleared for rebuilding, you might say. And out of that, God says, I'm going to keep a people for myself. And it talks about the people um, never again being uh, haughty, never again being, you know, harsh and unkind. They'll speak no lies, no deceit in their mouths. Um, so it's this picture of a restored people living in a restored city in a restored land. And that's where the, uh, the, the, I think the, I said earlier, some of my favorite verses in all of the Old Testament are found because then God speaks to his city and to the people, to his redeemed people within that city. And it's good enough. I'm just going to read it. Um, it says, on that day, they will say to Jerusalem, do not fear, O Zion, do not let your hands hang limp. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love, and he will rejoice over you with singing. 
Um, that's Zephaniah 3, 16 and 17. And I think, uh, boy, there, there are few images more compelling than that uh, of a God who is like the father who goes into the room where his little daughter is sleeping in the crib and just sings a lullaby over her and uh, rejoices over this redeemed child. Um, after all the judgment has come, after all he's dealt with all the wickedness and sins, and now he's that father again who holds his child in his arm and sings her to sleep. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a very, very moving picture to me uh, of, of God's, his, his love and his compassion. So that's, uh, and, and, and of course, we're going to get into it in just a couple minutes here. That doesn't just happen because God has a change of heart. God calls his people to repentance. He calls them, and there's that, that language, um, I think it's in uh, chapter 2, where it talks about seeking uh, shelter from God, seeking the Lord, um, finding finding safety in Him. So um, you know, there's the warning is is that the judgment is coming, but there's a call to seek shelter in Him. So, all right, questions on on that? That's uh, overview stuff. Any questions or comments on that? All right. So I want to hit on kind of some of these major themes and some of these I've already said a fair bit about and so I'm only going to cover them really briefly but um, the first theme is the judgment of the nations. Uh, we're looking at how God does, he, he will call and he did call all the nations to account. There would be no, no one could escape um, either by, you know, national or ethnic identity. They couldn't say, well, I'm a Jewish person and so I get a free pass or, well, I'm part of the nations of the world I didn't really know any better, so my evil doesn't um, doesn't count against me. That's that's not the case. Uh, God intended to judge the nations for their sins and for their wickedness, and and some of the sins listed include idolatry, uh, complacency towards God, uh, violence, um, just to name a few things. There's other hints as well at, at um, you know economic and and social corruption and social sin, and the nations would be called to answer for that. Um, the 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 yeah the nobody gets a free pass from from God's judgment. There would be they would be called to account, um, and and that would be we talked about that when we looked at Nahum. That's a that's a message of comfort for God's people in the sense that they had been oppressed, but it's also a warning to them because they don't get off the hook for it either. Um, so, anyways, that's that's uh, what that's that's the warning. That's that that God is coming to judge the nations. But then the other theme is this, this call to seek shelter. Um, and, and the question is, how do you, you know, so how do you find shelter? How do you seek out shelter? And the biblical answer is, well, um, seek shelter in God. But what does that mean? Well, um, we seek shelter by becoming righteous in, is, is sort of the short answer to it. Um, our righteousness is what will protect us from the wrath and the anger of God. Now that raises a whole other a host of very, very important questions, which is then how do you become righteous? If it's the righteous that will be preserved from judgment, and if it's the righteous who will be, um, you might say, pardoned, um, how, do you, how, do, how do you get that righteousness that will stand up to God's scrutiny, right? Uh, the language is used, all these nations, including Judah, will be put on the burn pile of judgment, well, how do you how do you avoid that, and how do you get the righteousness that will um, will endure that and be able to 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 withstand the scrutiny of God? Um, psalms fifteen and twenty four are sort of mirror psalms. They sound similar to each other, and they ask they both ask that question: Who can stand on God's holy hill? Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Uh, which is a way of saying who can stand in God's presence? Who can enter into um, before the the presence of God? Um, and, and then it kind of rehearses a number of qualifications of what does it look like to be righteous? You know, he with clean hands and a pure heart who doesn't lift up his soul to an idol and doesn't practice usury and uh, is not guilty of, of um, you know, sins, social sorts of sins. Uh, well, that's all fine and good, and you can go down that list, but it doesn't take you very long to realize that actually that doesn't fit me. That description doesn't fit anybody, right? No one can ever say I've never lifted up my my heart to an idol or I've never you know done anything that is is sinful and wrong. So so the dilemma is a very serious one. How do you gain the the righteousness that that will shelter us from the judgment of God? Um, and the answer, and we'll we'll flesh that out more in a couple minutes here, but. Um, the, the answer in, in Zephaniah 
is seek the Lord. Uh, that's chapter two. Seek the Lord, all you humble of the land. Seek you who do what he commands. Seek righteousness. Seek humility. Perhaps you will be sheltered on the day of the Lord's anger. Uh, that's chapter two, verse uh, verse three. Um, well, that that is only a partial answer. Um, it's all well and good to speak of seeking shelter in righteousness, but what is the righteousness that will withstand? And I'll answer that in a couple minutes. We already know the answer to it, but uh, we'll flesh that out more in a minute. Um, this, the, third, the third major theme has to do with the restoration of a remnant. Um, and this is a theme that God, that, that's kind of woven through much of the Old Testament. God is, whenever there's judgment uh, spoken, there's also this promise that God will preserve a people for himself. Um, you know, and you think, I can think of just a couple of examples where that theme is played out in different ways. Noah, right? The day of judgment comes upon, you know, um, very early times and, and Noah is told to build an ark. And what is, what God is doing there is he's preserving a people so that the covenant line from Eve might be maintained, right? So you get the whole rest of the world is, um, is rebelling and yet God is going to punish them, but he's also going to preserve that remnant. Um, you see it with, um, well, I think of Elijah, you know, poor Elijah, he has this great high moment on the on Mount Carmel and uh, all the prophets end up running for their lives. And, you know, you'd think that would be the time for a, a spiritual retreat or a sabbatical or something. But instead, um, poor Elijah goes off and he says, Lord, it's just me. I'm the only one. And, and God says, no, come on, get up. It's, you know, there's 700 others that are still that are prophets. And so that's that idea again. But maybe more to the point is, is when uh, the time of the exile comes is, is God makes that commitment that there will be a remnant that he preserves. No matter how bad things get, God is always preserving a people for himself. And uh, that's, what, that's what you read about there in, uh, in, chapter, um, in chapter three. God makes that commitment to keep that people for himself so that the covenant line might continue on and so that his, his um, covenant promises made back to Abraham and to King David and, you know, so that those, that lineage might be preserved and ultimately so that the, the covenant might find its fulfillment in the person of Jesus, right? Jesus has to be able to trace his lineage back to, uh, to Abraham and to David and such. And so um, God preserves a remnant to ensure that that would happen, uh, even in the midst of judgment. So judgment is, it's, it's total, but, but it's also, yeah, God is also faithful and merciful in terms of preserving a, um, a people for himself. All right, uh, last theme, um, before we get into fleshing out how do we see the gospel in all of this, um, the theme of the city of God, and this is, I'm, I'm glad you kind of brought that up earlier, Debbie, because the, the city of God is, is, is probably not the primary theme here in Zephaniah, but there is in chapter three, you, you get this transition where it starts talking about the nature of the city. And I think to really appreciate this theme, you have to look at just what it is that cities represent in, in the Bible. Um, and, and big picture, I mean, you, you know, we start off, of course, in a garden, right? Garden of Eden. And a garden, you might argue, is sort of an undeveloped city. Um, and, and then when God puts Adam and Eve to work, there's this idea of, you know, bring out the potential of the world, cultivate the, the raw material. And, um, and, of course, that's what they do. But always cities are, we're finding that cities are also often very, very corrupt and sinful places, right? So you get the sense that the, this is creation that's really distorted. Um, creative purpose is really distorted. Um, God establishes his city, of course, the city of Jerusalem to be his capital city. And that's a, a sort of both a figurative or symbolic and a literal um, it, it sort of thing because you have, you know, symbolically it represents the place of, you know, God's power. It's, you know, the Lord is here. It's Mount Zion. It represents all of these, these sort of deeper spiritual ideas of God's dwelling place and his base of operations in the world. Um, but in reality, it's also, I mean, it's also meant to be a place where we actually see this is, you know, God's, the king lives in the city and from the king, from the city, the king governs. And so cities kind of play these, a very important role. It's a, it's a representative place of, of power and influence and, um, and, and God's presence and mission in the world. Um, and so the city of Jerusalem, it wasn't just that, hey, that's where hap a lot of people happen to live. It represented all of those things. But the, the sins and the corruption of the people also uh, really damaged that city. And so you get the priesthood and you get the prophets and you get the, um, 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 the kings who are really uh, not living up to their their calling. And so the city becomes a place of, of real corruption. Um, 
fast forward, we get to, you know, you get into, well, yeah, so, so let, I'll get to that in a second. So you get this, this you know, you get these cities that are, are con- corrupted and contaminated by sin, but also you get this promise that God makes to restore the city. And that's, that's much more than just sort of urban renewal. That's, although, you know, we can call it that. It's much more than just um, God saying, okay, look, the people will come back and they'll rebuild the infrastructure and the buildings and the temple. And, but it also represents this idea of spiritual renewal where God's rule and authority in the world will be reestablished and, and recognized again. And um, the purposes of cities will be uh, more fully and more completely um, realized. Um, we see that happening. I think it's, it's worth noting that as you go forward into the ministry of Jesus, I'm getting a little ahead of myself here, but since I'm on the thought, um, you know, Jesus, as he's going in towards uh, the cross, remember, he looks out over the city of Jerusalem and he says, you have rejected me. You have turned your, your back on me. Um, and there's that sense that it's not just the Jewish people, but it's also the city is stubborn and it's refusing to, um, to, to yeah, it's still bearing these marks of sin. But ultimately, God intends to redeem that city, and I'll I'll finish that thought in a couple minutes. I don't want to get too far ahead of myself here, but but there is that idea that that the city of Jerusalem had been corrupted, but it would be restored. That God would 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 once again, and that's where that verse comes in of looking over and rejoicing over you with singing, rejoicing over the city again as a renewed place of for God's uh, for God's people. Um, let me pause there and see if you have any questions or comments at this point. Go ahead. Uh, okay, I was thinking, as you're talking about this, it seems it's it's so good to hear this because we tend to think, at least I do, of a city as, um, you know, this is he's addressing God's people. Mm-hmm. He's talking about Jerusalem, mm-hmm. and he, yeah, a city is made up of people, mm-hmm. and so it's not it's not me separating myself from the people in my city. Right. And saying you guys are the bad people, right. and God's going to judge you. Of course, He will. But mm-hmm. just as you had mentioned before in this theme, is that I must not assume because I'm a Christian or a believer that God's judgment, sorry, <laughs> um, will p- bypass me because right. I belong to Him. That's and right. so I think in the life of a city. Uh, where we God has put us to remember. Yet, yes, we are a part of this city that will be judged. Yes. And yes. Are we? Are we uh, looking to Him in a way to in in humility and not just yeah. standing on, uh, you know, uh, a, a a a form, but rather a uh, a heart change and a and a repentance ourselves. Yeah. I kind of that's where my mind went. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, I think I think that's right. I mean, and again, that raises some of those age-old tensions of okay, what does it mean to be to live in a city? We aren't, you know. I think of I think the best picture is when the Israelites are in exile, right? A couple, few decades after this is written, and God actually says, "Seek the good of the city." Right? You're living in and among these pagan people who worship different gods, and their ethics and their morality is very different. But don't. Um, don't look down and judge them and be all haughty and self-righteous about it, but actually go and work for the good of the city, work for, you know, good streets and, you know, good industry and good business or whatever else it might be. Because as, as, as God says it, when the city prospers, you will prosper as well. And I think that becomes, you know, a picture for us. Yes, there is this reality that God will bring judgment, but it's also a calling to us to say, okay, what are we doing to be that salt and that light? remembering that our ultimate home is is the city of god and yet we're living here in this in you know in the city of salem or wherever it is that we happen to live walking that out is always difficult to know just how to do it and um but but that i think is is really how we are to see our our role in this world um and because you know the 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 very final chapter the last couple chapters in the new testament well what is it it's a city Right, We're, and it's not a city that we get somehow evaporated up into, but it's a city that comes down to us. Mm-hmm. It's New Jerusalem. It's God's redeemed dwelling place where God's presence is with us. There's been a lot of speculation on what does that all entail. Um, 
I suspect it means a city will be a city. You know, in, in, in other words, heaven will involve for us some of the work that cities are today. I mean, culture and art and music and, uh, you know, maybe, you know, again, there's debate on this, but, but work. I mean, will we, will we be able to work in the city? I think we will. I know that there are others that disagree, but I think, you know, you start to, you take away too much of that and you start to lose out on what actually a city represents, you know? So, um, so I, yeah. And, and then, then it becomes, okay, how do we sort of kind of paint a, a scale model or a sketch of that today in our engagement with, with the city? Right. So it raises lots of fascinating questions, I think, and, and lots of issues that are uh, woven from Genesis one to revelation chapter 22. Yeah. And I think, Pastor, it's so important, like you're bring as you bring this up, for at least for me, for believers to to see, you know, the tendency sometimes if things when things get kind of difficult uh, in in uh, politics and in all co- sorts of life to just withdraw, mm-hmm. but right. God God pushes us out. Right. We cannot, you know, it's not right for me to do that. I I need to. You know, if God's judgments are bring make righteousness um, in the land, people to learn righteousness, then then I'm part of that that part that God has placed, and so it's he. I do shelter in Him, but He's my protection, and so all fear should be should you know work at that you know battle that fear so that I can be a part of the city that he's called me to oh, yeah. in, in a secular way, but with God, you know, in and through me. Absolutely. That, I, I couldn't have said that any better myself. That's, that's so true, right? Because, and, and this is a good segue into, into how do we understand the gospel in light of all of this. If we don't have the gospel, then our engagement to the city, with the city, is either going to be very prideful, Right. I can do this, put in place my vision of a social program, social justice, you know, government, et cetera, my vision, and and I'll become very prideful about myself and judgmental towards others, or you become cynical and fearful, like, well, you know, look at the world around us, look how terrible it is, look at the crime and the poverty and the corruption and the racism and the economic injustice and the homelessness, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Well, the gospel actually gives us a whole new way to look at this. and which, which, just for sake of time, I'm going to keep us moving on that. But, but you said that so well, and I think that's that's just a perfect way to to jump in out of this next theme, which is where do we see the gospel in all this? Well, the first is that actually we have to contend with the reality of judgment. When Jesus shows up, well, let's say this way: before Jesus shows up, it's John the Baptist who comes, and John the Baptist comes and he says, "Look." Um, I'm here to announce that, that Jesus is coming, yes, but I'm also here to call you to repentance. Uh, you know, and he's, you know, so he has this engagement, and you can find it in uh, Matthew 3 and Luke 3, I think it is, where, and he calls different groups to different things, you know, so he calls the soldiers, he says, you know, don't practice um, extortion, he calls the taxpayers to be fair and just in the money that they're collecting, he calls the Pharisees to, you know, to repent of their self-righteousness, Um and so the, the whole thing is, is that Jesus is calling, or John the Baptist is calling people to escape the coming judgment. He says the axe is at the root of the tree. So judgment is coming, and that is what prepares, that's sort of like what levels the ground and prepares us for the coming of Jesus, is this announcement that judgment is real, that God does intend to punish the sins of the world. But there's also, you know, so that's that's the first thing is we need to seek shelter, right? I think that's what the, the book of Zephaniah calls us to is seek shelter from judgment. It's a real thing. God is not, um, you know, he's not going to just ignore or overlook uh, the sins of this world. But then the question is, okay, where? how do we, you know, if, if seeking, if, if being sheltered from, from judgment is found by seeking righteousness, where do we find that? And of course, you know, religion, as I said earlier, religion teaches us, well, you work at it, you create it yourself, you be a good person, you try to love your neighbor, you try to, you know, uh, you really institute social justice, or you try to live by the, the Sermon on the Mount, or you try to follow the golden rule. All religions have some variant of that. Um, but, but of course, you know, the, the gospel takes a different approach. And, and I say gospel, even in contrast to those who, um, who, who approach the Bible, who, 
as a sort of moral handbook, right? There's a lot of people who profess Christianity, but really what they're doing is they're treating the Bible like it's a moral code book. And okay, if I just do all these things, this is what God wants me to do. But the message of the Bible from the beginning to the end is that, well, as, as Isaiah 64 puts it, our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. In other words, the righteousness that we need that will shelter us from God's judgment is we don't have it and we can't possess it. Um, so where, you know, okay, that only heightens the problem. Well, what do we do? Well, of course, you know, okay, this is the Sunday school answer. We know the answer is Jesus, but, but it's so important that the Bible talks about G uh, being clothed in Christ. Um, the solution for our problem, it comes from outside of us. It's something that we receive. We trade places with God in the sense that we give him our tattered rags of unrighteousness, and we call on the name of the Lord, which is, again, talked about here in, in um, um, Zephaniah. To call on the name of the Lord is, is to humble ourselves and say, look, my, you know, all my goodness is, is nothing, right? Um, I think it was a Flannery O'Connor who, who said that we not only, maybe not her, but she's written about this theme anyways. Um, but we also have to, so we have to repent of our evil, but we also have to repent of our good, <laughs> Uh, right? We have to acknowledge that my good isn't good enough, and sometimes I'm trying to do good for all the wrong reasons, and I'm trying to earn brownie points with God. Well, to seek shelter in the righteousness of God is to come humble. It's to be humbled and say, I have nothing, and my only hope to be sheltered from judgment is to call on Jesus and to say, he's the one. And, and then we, the Bible says, of course, we are clothed in that righteousness. We wear the garments of, of Jesus's perfection, um, and that's, that's really, you know, so that's, that's what the, you know, the message of, of Zephaniah, that's the message of, of what the gospel is, is all about. Um, when we are clothed in Christ, and we need not fear judgment, we need not fear the, the, the anger of God. Um, so that's, those are the first two things, right? So John the Baptist um, is a, sort of that picture, we, we are warned that God's judgment is coming, but Jesus then provides us a way that we can withstand that judgment. The last thing, and, and again, we've talked a fair bit about this, um, but is this idea of urban renewal. Um, the Bible is, so we start in a garden, but the Bible is moving us towards a new city, um, you know, and, and it's a city that God himself institutes. Um, it's, it's telling, I think, that Jesus, when he's crucified, there's a number of places that make it clear that Jesus was crucified outside the city gates. So the dwelling place of God, the city of God actually rejects her own savior but Jesus, his work on the cross accomplishes the salvation for, his, for God's people so that then we might, I think, live, and I'm covering over a huge amount of territory here in a very short amount of time, but the, the purpose then is, okay, Jesus was put outside the gate so that as God's redeemed people, we might then be put into the city and we might work not to accomplish or establish God's kingdom because we can't do that, but rather to give the world a picture of what the city of God will look like if that makes sense. And so in our work, in our leisure, in our, you know, everything from, you know, when you think about what does it mean for, a, you know, to actually plan a city and all the things that go into that, we think, okay, as Christians, we ought to be desiring, okay, how can, how can we give a picture to God's redemptive work in Christ in this? And every person then living out their calling, that's what it sort of becomes. It's a new way then to understand, you know, the world of our work and our calling, et cetera, um, civil engagement, voting, all of those things that are about, okay, this, you know, the world is not going to be a utopian paradise that we can usher in. So we can't be prideful about any of this. But we also recognize that, hey, God is sovereign and he's ruling over this and we're called to then labor in and work in this world so that the world begins to get a little picture of what the city of God is like. We're not shaped by, or we shouldn't be shaped by the ideals of the worldly city, um, but by the heavenly city. And, and as we've talked about, that's not always easy to, to walk that out, right? Sometimes the attitudes and the prevailing mindset of the worldly city are more influential than we even realize, but, um, but we're called to sort of then, yeah, kind of walk that out and, and give that, that, um, scale model, you might say, of the heavenly city that, that God will bring in one day. Um, any questions on that? Comments, thoughts? Go Pastor, ahead. Pastor, would you recommend um, a, a book or, or, uh, or some, some, I mean, this is, I've heard of this a long time, and of course, Augustine's The City of God. I mean, is, is that something you recommend to read? Um, 
Yes, but I have to confess, I've not myself read that book. Um, it's a very, uh, it's it's on my list, but it's a very, very lengthy book. Um, right. But it, I know that it's considered a classic on this whole idea of, you know, worldly city versus heavenly city. Um, I just finished reading, oh, a month ago, um, a book. It's by David Van Drunen, and it's on that two kingdom theology that I mentioned a little bit ago, which is... Um, uh, the book is called Living in God's Two Kingdoms. Now, I didn't agree with everything that he said, but uh, he he writes from a very uh, uh, conservative reform position, but in ways that I think are very, very helpful. Um, as I said, I think he, he my, my critique of him is that he drives, I think, too sharp of a wedge between um, maybe this world and the next, mm. some places, okay? Now, without getting into the whole dynamics of the book, um, but he, he's really helpful in actually saying, look, there are ways that we need to live in this world as engaged people. And, um, you know, he, he draws kind of, he helps us kind of understand, okay, God is operating sort of on these two covenants or these two, you know, there's sort of the broad worldly kingdom that God is upholding and sustaining all of creation and all of society and all of culture. And then there's, so, so that's going to entail a lot of, a lot more broad, um, yeah, laws or, or, yeah, precepts maybe be a better word. But then as Christians, we're called to a different way of living within that broader kingdom. So we're kind of, we got a foot in both camps. He, he might say maybe that's not doing full justice to what he's saying, but but he writes some very thought-provoking stuff. It's not a very long book. It's probably 150 pages or something like that. Um, and I'd loan you my copy, except for I borrowed my copy from someone else and I had to record it. So, <laughs> that's, um, that's fine. Is there that, something you would recommend? I mean, that you, so you would recommend that with, you know, a couple of caveats, but um, I just love this, this theme. I've loved it in, in Hebrews when it says that Abraham was looking mm -hmm. for a city yeah. um, with God. And so it's just touched my heart always, that theme. And I'm just wondering how I can dive into it you know, you know, yeah. um, I am looking over at my, I've got a whole bookshelf that deals with all these questions of culture and work and vocation. Um, and there's a couple of them. Let me, so culture making by Andy Crouch is really good. Andy Crouch is the former editor of Christianity today, a very good writer, very thoughtful. Um, there's a book by, uh, yeah, I got to read that kingdom calling by Amy Sherman. That is really, really good. And then um, yeah, there's one more I was going to mention. I can't remember which one it was. I mean, I've got a bunch on, on like, so Tim Keller has one that's called Every Good Endeavor. That deals more with the topic of work, but in in that sort of framework that I've been talking about. So that's that's another, those, you know, I don't know how much longer this quarantine is going to last, but uh, <laughs> <laughs> okay good so Thanks. yeah these you know what these and you've probably read a ton of books on art as well um and and faith but there's uh i've got there's a number like francis schaefer has written really well and really thoughtfully on on the role of art in christian life um so has um gene veith um you know his books uh, his book on art i read it oh i don't know three weeks ago it was like it was okay. It was pretty basic. I don't think there'd be anything in there that would shock you or, but it's, it was kind of like a good overview of, of how the Bible, how art plays a place of importance in the Bible. Um, yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to go and look a little more deeper, but those are some of the ones to start with on yeah, that's good. That Thank you. those themes of, you know, redeeming vocation in light of this, this, um, you know, kingdom of God. So, um, which is maybe a good, a good way to, um, wrap up here just a couple points of application right number one seek shelter i i you know we all have to seek our shelter our righteousness where it can withstand um judgment right you you hear these stories of you know when forest fires go through a uh uh i think it was through yellowstone park i you know i don't know that's probably 25 30 years ago now where the forest fires really did a lot of damage there in yellowstone and there's a story of a, of a fire ranger or a park ranger afterwards walking through the absolute devastation and uh, it was just a terrible heartbreaking sight and of course some of the animals are still you know they're burned to death and which is just awful but um then on one occasion he he 
sort of, I don't know, with his boot or whatever, kind of nudged. It was like a mother that had been sitting on her, her baby chicks to shelter them. And of course the mother had perished in this fire. And so the, you know, park ranger just nudged the, the body of this little bird aside. Well, lo and behold, there are all these little baby chicks still alive underneath that mother bird. The mother bird had actually preserved them from the fire. And, you know, that's what Christ does with us. That's how, what it is to take shelter in Christ. And so, you know, whoever may be watching this, I don't know, um, but, but this is, the biblical picture is that, yes, God takes sin very seriously, the sins of the world. Um, he doesn't turn a blind eye to, you know, greed and corruption and violence and, um, you know, all the, the ways that power are misused and so on and so on and so on. But he also provides a way that we can be judgment, uh, be spared the judgment. Um, in a way, it's kind of ironic. You seek shelter from God by going to God, but but it's we go to God in Jesus, and in Jesus, then we find that shelter that will withstand the judgment, um, and we will be saved. Um, so that's that's application point number one. Number two is find our home in the city. Now that doesn't mean go out and let the world shape and define you and, and put you into its own mold, but it means these things that we've been talking about. We're called to give the, the world a picture of what the heavenly city will look like. That means engagement in the world. It means that we, um, you know, we're, we're loyal to the true city of God, but we're called, you know, to be citizens. Well, we be careful with our language. Citizens of the heavenly kingdom while residents of this kingdom, of, the, of this world. Um, it's been said in the world, but not of the world. Well, that, you know, that holds up pretty well, I think. Um, we don't discard or turn our backs on the communities that we live in, but we're called to seek them, seek their good, so that the world sees a little bit, just a little tiny glimpse of what God's kingdom will look like. Um, and then finally, um, seek the joy of the nations, which is a way of saying, it's a way of recognizing that, uh, excuse me, that God uh, that all nations will stand before the bar of God's justice, and no nation can claim an advantage, and, and no nation can um, can can get away with anything. All one day, all nations will stand before the bar of God's justice, and God intends to be ruler of all nations. So, there is this sense in which there'll be, you know, God's kingdom is a multicultural kingdom. Nations don't lose their identity or their culture under God's rule, but it's perfected and it's transformed, and so. Yeah, that that ought to, um, yeah, that's a calling to us. And we've talked about that when we looked at the book of Jonah and other places as well. But um, that's a that propels us into mission, I think, and um, and calls us to remember that God is a global king, a king of all the nations. So, all right, well, that's that's it for today. Um, that uh, next week we're going to look at uh, the book of uh, ha uh, Haggai. Um, which, uh, yeah, will continue some of the themes of, of yeah, priesthood and, and king. But uh, anyways, so I'm going to stop sharing the screen. And uh, Debbie, if you have any questions, I'll um, be happy to entertain them before we sign off here. Um, no, but I sure like where you are right now. Look like <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is that's a dream. We, I, um, Amy and I went there seven years ago. This is St. Martin. Uh, it was our it was our ten year anniversary. We had to wait two extra years to take it. Just but uh, it's off wow. the St. Martin, and I'll tell you that's a beautiful place to be, uh, warm and tropical, and yeah. So that's where that was. I took that picture um, on on I think it was called Bay Rouge in in on the French side. It's at St. Martin's a double island. It's half Dutch, half French, and this was on the French side. So anyway. Uh, I may have lost you, Debbie. I'm not sure, but uh, I am going to um, I'm going to sign off. I'm going to stop the recording here.